Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park historian Jim Ogden stands front-facing in uniform of a tan flat hat, gray shirt, and green trousers. He stands in a large grassy field. In the distance, some ways, is a road and a monument and a thick wooded area. Good morning, and thank you for tuning in for uh, this program. Um, as um, the National Military Park this year recognizes the 157th anniversary of the Battle of Chickamauga in a virtual fashion. We stand now along the west side of the Lafayette Road and for the last two days, Friday, September the 18th, Saturday, September the 19th, Braxton Bragg had maneuvered his forces in the hope of cutting this road, this vital route for the Union Army, as the bulk of it comes out of the mountains to the south-southwest of here and tries to get back up towards Chattanooga, cutting this route between the Union Army and Chattanooga, and hopefully, as Bragg had originally designed, driving the Union Army southwestward to crush them against the wall of Lookout Mountain in McLemore's Cove. But uh, uh, for those of you all who were able to join us for the programs on Friday and Saturday, you know that things had not gone um, well. And while now, um, as a result of the, uh, the fighting on September the 19th, one of um, the largest, costliest battles of the Civil War is unfolding, it is not unfolding exactly the way that Bragg had desired. But despite that, he still had the potential opportunity to achieve his commander's intent of interposing his army between the Union Army and Chattanooga. As the fighting died down on September the 19th, some of Braxton Bragg's senior subordinates had made their way to, their, to his headquarters, down, located then down near Thedford's Ford. Now, unfortunately for Braxton Bragg, not all of those commanders arrived at the same time, and Bragg, therefore, will wind up issuing his orders for another day's battle to each of those commanders largely separately. And as a result, there won't be the full, complete understanding between Bragg and those subordinates and between those subordinates themselves with ex exactly what was to happen. Braxton Bragg, that night of the 19th, also reorganized his army. Frustrated with his um, inability to get his orders carried out um, in McLemore's Cove on September 10th and 11th, near Lee and Gordon's Mill on September the 13th, and now here um, in the valley of West Chickamauga Creek on September the 18th and 19th, Braxton Bragg will divide his army into two wings a right wing, which he will put under the command of Leonidas Polk, the, one of his longtime corps commanders and one of his most recalcitrant um, of, of senior subordinates. And the left wing he will assign to the command of James Longstreet, who is bringing two divisions of the Army of Northern Virginia as reinforcements. And he assigns command of that left wing to James Longstreet even before Longstreet has arrived on the battlefield. And Bragg's general concept of the action, or for the action on September the 20th, is an attack in echelon by division. He wanted all of the divisions of his army, then 10, soon to be 11, to get online side by side to one another from north to south. And at day dawn, the first bit of daylight, he wanted that rightmost division of Leonidas Polk's right wing to jump off and begin the attack. And Bragg anticipated that that division would then strike the Union line and begin driving the Union line back. And as soon as that division had moved forward, the next division to the south, seeing that, it, it would move forward. And as it struck the Union line, Bragg's expectation was that it would join in driving the Union line back. And as that second division moved, the third division would move and strike the line. Bragg envisioned uh, this attack flowing from north to south in rapid succession 
as each division went into action with the hope of driving the Union line back in their front. And since it would progress from north to south, it would be like making a giant left wheel. Um, and in the process, as Bragg hoped, he would begin driving the Union troops off to the southwest and down towards McLemore's Cove, and his army would then wind up between the Union Army and Chattanooga, and Bragg hoped that he could still achieve his goal of crushing the Union Army of the Cumberland against the wall of Lookout Mountain. It is a plan. It is theoretically a possible plan. However, in Bragg's fractured command structure, where the relationship between he and his subordinates um, is weak at best, the uh, reorganization and the plan of action for the 20th does not filter down this new chain of command. Um, and therefore, when dawn came on the morning of September the 20th, Bragg's army is not ready to attack. For Bragg's opponent, William Stark Rosecrans, the command situation was better. Not ideal, but certainly better than Bragg. One of the things that William Stark Rosecrans did on the night of the 19th is that he had a true council of war or leaders meeting. He called to his headquarters at the home of the Widow Glens, the site of where the Wilder Brigade Monument is located today, his senior um, subordinates, and there they gathered um, uh, that evening. They discussed what had happened during the course of the day um, and what they anticipated and planned for um, a, a, another day's battle. Deciding not to withdraw from the area where this engagement was unfolding, in part because it would um, endanger some of the uh, Army's wagon train that had still not yet passed from south to north um, out of the mountains and moved northward beyond Missionary Ridge to the west and back towards Chattanooga, but also because of the large number of wounded of the Army of the Cumberland who have been gathered in division field hospitals that have been created in the uh, area of um, Crawfish Springs and even as much as a mile away from Crawfish Springs. Some of the Union wounded were so badly injured that they could not stand to bear transportation back towards Chattanooga. And so to reposition the Army back closer to Chattanooga would mean potentially abandoning hundreds of wounded Union soldiers. And that was not something that they wanted to do. They decide that they will stay and fight, but fight on the defensive. Um, and even before this Council of War had um, begun, the uh, troops of the Army of the Cumberland, particularly within George Thomas's 14th Corps sector, or the left or northern half of the um, line as it had developed on September the 19th, um, George Thomas had begun to position his troops in anticipation of another day's battle. Thomas had realized that just to the east of the Lafayette Road um, and a couple of hundred yards into the, uh, the woods was another low rise of ground that ran basically north and south and parallel to the Lafayette Road. And already he had troops of Absalom Baird's, Richard Johnson's, and John Palmer's divisions taking post along the crest of that low rise of ground. And they decide that they will build their line off of that and continue it then southward. Unable to continue um, west, or excuse me, east of the road along the crest of that low rise because of some Confederate troops that occupied it, they have to turn the line back um, on the west side of the road and on off to the, uh, to the southwest. That line that um, Thomas's troops begin to deploy along is the line that is today along which the uh, greatest majority of Battle Line Road runs and is represented by all those Union monuments along the, um, uh, the west side or right side of Battle Line Road as you drive along. The, uh, they also recognized that most likely the Confederates would attack them um, on their left flank, the northern end of their line, 
the line back um, of the part of their line closest to Chattanooga. As noted um, earlier, Rosecrans, by studying the, uh, the maps and his troop dis dispositions and thinking how Bragg might attack um, him to some advantage for Bragg, Rosecrans, and George Thomas, and others had recognized that the left end of the Union line was most important. And during the uh, Council of War, George Thomas, who had marched uh, much of the night before and then fought throughout the 19th, um, dozed. But periodically he was awakened and offered the advice of, I would strengthen the left, strengthen the left. It's not only where um, he is, but it also is a reflection of their acknowledgement of the importance of the left end of their line and that it was that end of their line where Bragg might attack with the greatest um, chance of success. After the Council of War is, um, is over, um, they enjoy some ham and biscuits and Alexander McCook favors them with a, um, a song, The Hebrew Maiden's Lament. And they then will, um, will break up um, and, in, uh, and the three Corps commanders, George Thomas, um, Alexander McCook, and Tom Crittenden will ride out to begin issuing their orders down their chain of command and do further positioning of their troops. George Thomas will essentially command the left or northern half of the Union line, Alexander McCook the right or southern half of the Union line, and Tom Crittenden, a small two-division reserve for the Union position on the field. The greatest weakness for the Union Army is in the um, person of William Stark Rosecrans himself, who after the Council of War did not go, um, uh, go and get some much needed sleep but he goes yet another night um, with no sleep, and the sleep deficit resulting in um, uh, muddled thinking, which will become uh, very clear on September the 20th, um, only increases. When George Thomas returned to his sector and issued his orders, he got a little bit of sleep, but well before dawn, he is up riding around. And Thomas had originally hoped that the Union line would be able to extend further to the north along that low rise of ground on the east side of the Lafayette Road. But as the troops were positioned, the need to draw troops southward to have a more consolidated line um, was, uh, was recognized and had to be accepted. And Thomas then looks to position troops to protect this area, and he requests his own division under James Negley, which was then in line further to the south in the area of the Brotherton Farm. He requests Negley's division to be marched northward, and Thomas originally was going to deploy Negley's division um, in, in the woods or at the edge of the woods just to our, um, our south here and extending westward, not possessing this ground, not even possessing the McFarland Gap Road, which at the time ran um, just a, a few yards to the north of where I am, um, and then on westward to join the uh, modern alignment of the road. Um, but while he would not possess this ground, he would indeed cover it by fire. The 1st Brigade of Nagley's Division, commanded by John um, Beatty, did arrive in time and was initially deployed astride the Lafayette Road facing to the north. But Beatty's position would then be, um, be changed as a result of an order from one of Thomas's staff officers. And John Beatty's small 1,200-man, four-regiment um, brigade will essentially then conduct a giant right wheel across this terrain um, with the intention of swinging up onto that low rise of ground further to the north. But one small brigade can't cover the ground that it would take more than a division to, um, to cover. And as Beatty's men wheel um, uh, right towards their new position, they, um, uh, or spaces or gaps or intervals will open between the regiments. Um, the 15th Kentucky in the woods um, across the road 
the 104th Illinois marching through the, uh, the field there, and the two Indiana regiments moving up to the area of the McDonald Farm um, and starting their swing to the east. Beatty's um, artillery battery, Bridges, Illinois battery from the Chicago area, be positioned um, uh, with part of the battery where their um, gun monuments and monument are today. Um, but for a time, three guns are moved to the north to fire into the other um, intervals. All of this, though, is happening after daylight. And the Federals have the opportunity to do this because Bragg's day dawn attack has not occurred. In this fractured command um, environment where there is poor communication, both Bragg's order for a reorganization and the dawn attack has not filtered down the chain of command. And the two divisions that were supposed to open the attack that morning, the two divisions of Daniel Harvey Hill's Corps the Corps having now been subordinated to Leonidas Polk and his right wing, the order for their role in the dawn attack has not um, reached those two divisions. Claiborne's division had participated in the fighting late on September the 19th, and his men had slept on their arms on the battlefield. Breckenridge's men had participated in the fighting um, at Glasses Mill on the 19th, and then marched northward, and um, late on the uh, 19th, had crossed West Chickamauga Creek at Alexander's Bridge, bivouacked in a cornfield on the Alexander Farmstead, and then before dawn, marched north and deployed on Claiborne's right or to the north. But, um, but Claiborne and Breckenridge's um, uh, lines were not perfectly aligned. There was a gap or interval um, between them. Um, and while there was some expectation that they would go into action that morning, they had no orders for a dawn attack. Many of the men, the majority of the men in Breckenridge's and Claiborne's division, having not eaten in 24, 36, or 48 hours, when the food for September the 19th arrived right about dawn, the decision was to have the mostly boiled beef and cornbread distributed to the troops of Breckenridge's and Claiborne's men. As that process began, about 30 minutes later, a set of orders for the dawn, day dawn attack, now almost an hour ago, finally arrived. But with the troops having not eaten um, for 24 or more hours, and now in the process, of receiving the rations for the day before. The decision was on the part of Hill, and really the, uh, the, the right decision given the men's condition, that the men must be allowed time to eat. However, this logistical breakdown would mean that more than three hours of daylight would pass before the Confederate assault finally began. Three hours of daylight during which George Thomas made adjustments to the position of his troops on the field, allowing John Beatty's brigade of Nagley's division to arrive and be positioned here. Um, and during those three hours of daylight, much of the work constructing the field fortifications, the log works or log barricades along Thomas's line now essentially bowed around the Kelly field. That work occurred after um, daylight that morning. About 9.30, the troops of the rightmost Confederate Infantry Division, the division commanded by former United States Vice President John Cable Breckinridge, a proud Kentuckian, that division, about 3,600 men strong, three brigades arrayed on a nearly mile's front, um, jumped off in their assault. And when that division moved westward towards what they thought was the location of the Union line, they would find that they were attacking largely to the north of where the real Union line by that time um, uh, was located. The, br the brigades of um, uh, Dan Adams, Louisiana and Alabama troops, and the brigade of Marcellus Stovall, Floridians, North Carolinians and Georgians, will attack westward and will strike 
the, um, the left three brigade regiments of John Beatty's brigade um, and drive them across the Lafayette Road. And those two brigades themselves will cross the Lafayette Road, Adams, Louisianans, and Alabamans, in the area where the um, John McDonald Farmstead was, where the visitor center is today, and Stovall's brigade in the area where the Florida Monument stands along the Lafayette Road. Um, those troops will cross the Lafayette Road and in so doing, finally begin to uh, accomplish what it was Bragg had hoped for the last two days, to interpose troops between the Union Army and Chattanooga. However, it is only two small brigades and part of Breckinridge's third um, Benjamin Helms, Kentucky Orphan Brigade, its um, right half reaching the Lafayette Road as well and capturing two guns of Bridges, Illinois Battery. It is only this small force that has actually gotten astride the road. One of the weaknesses of Bragg's plan now begins to unfold um, or be recognized by deploying all of his divisions online. There is no weight on that critical right flank. However, Breckenridge, hearing the sound of fighting with the left of Helm's Brigade striking the Union left, will order um, the troops of um, Adams Brigade on the west side of the Lafayette Road to turn south, and Stovall is to form his brigade on the east side of the road and march it south as well. Um, those two brigades will pass southward along either side of the Lafayette Road and towards what they thought was the Union left flank. This attack, striking um, essentially right where Rosecrans and Thomas and other Union commanders had um, both anticipated and feared, is perhaps a harbinger of um, a major Confederate assault. And within the Union um, command, it will begin to create stress um, as they move to adjust troop positions to um, address this assault, which might be not just a portion of Breckenridge's small division, but might be the lead element of a much larger force. And in the um, uh, troop movements associated with, uh, with this, with reserves being sent from within Thomas's own sector around Kelly Field, within um, his sector extending further to, further to the south on the west side of the Lafayette Road from um, Tom Crittenden's small reserve, the situation will um, develop where the sleep deprived and physically and mentally exhausted William Stark Rosecrans um, will, um, after 10.30, begin to receive the information that causes him to make that um, fateful uh, order that does result in the uh, further, shift, further shifting of troops to the south that opens the gap briefly in the line um, and on which the Battle of Chickamauga turns. But as we look along this section of the Lafayette Road, we look at the sector where on the morning of September the 20th, where even after two days of movement and action here in the valley of West Chickamauga Creek, Sunday morning's fight shows that there was still a chance for Braxton Bragg to win the Battle of Chickamauga as he had originally intended. The pictures shown in this video are described as follows. Image number one, a black and white photo of Confederate General Leonidas Polk, forward facing, standing with gray hair and gray full beard, wearing a dark uniform with general's insignia of three stars within a wreath on the collar and two rows of brass buttons buttoned down the front. A sword belt around the waist holds a sword at his left side and white gloves are worn on each hand. Image number two, a black and white photo of Confederate General James Longstreet seated, forward facing, with dark hair and dark full beard, wearing a gray Confederate general's coat with general's insignia of three stars within a wreath on the collar 
and two rows of brass buttons buttoned down the front. Image number three, a black and white photo of Union General George Thomas, seated, forward facing, with dark hair combed backward and graying full beard, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with two stars of a Major General insignia on the shoulder and two rows of brass buttons buttoned down the front. Image number four, a black and white photo of Union General James Nagley, forward facing, with dark hair combed backward and full dark mustache and dark sideburns, wearing a dark blue Union General's coat with one star of a Brigadier General insignia on the shoulder and two rows of brass buttons down the front. His right hand is placed inside the right row of buttons. Image number five, an after war black and white photo of Union General John Beatty forward facing with gray hair and gray beard with long gray goatee, wearing a dark suit with white shirt and black tie. Image number six, a black and white photo of Confederate General Patrick Claiborne seated forward facing but slightly turned with dark hair combed to the side and full dark goatee, wearing a light gray Confederate general's coat with general's insignia of three stars within a wreath on the collar and two rows of brass buttons unbuttoned and a dark colored vest with a single row of brass buttons unbuttoned down the front. Image number seven, a black and white photo of Confederate General John C. Breckinridge seated, forward facing, but slightly turned, with dark hair combed to the side and full dark handlebar mustache wearing a light gray Confederate general's coat with general's insignia of three stars within a wreath on the collar and two rows of brass buttons buttoned down the front. 